In the past years, the discourse on smart cities has become a commonplace. Computer geeks, companies like Cisco or IBM, grassroots movements and politicians all refer themselves to a vision of the city that would be better managed thanks to the intensive use of digital technology from chips to computer and smartphones. In the same perspective, small cities are, uh, smart cities are get, supposed to get greener because of their greater efficiency in energy management. They are above all thought to allow new kinds of participatory action. In other words, they are, they are very often presented as a contribution to rethink what democracy is about at the municipal scale. So my, my first question would be, are smart city the new utopian discourse of the digital age in the urban and architectural domain? I will probably, you know, being French, I will probably answer by saying yes and no. <laughs> yes, no, because Actually, smart cities are already partly a reality. We do live, and we've been living for quite a number of years, in cities which are smart. Uh, and in addition, day after day, pretty much all over the world, cities are experimenting, changing the way they conceive their technical infrastructure, the role played by their citizen, their perspective of growth, all that because of the pervasive presence of digital technology. Above all, one may wonder, even if one pushes and say, what if smart cities were actually intelligent city in the sense of a non-human form of intelligence? That may seem you know, a very far-fetched kind of perspective, and science fiction uh, has elaborated a lot about that. But actually, we are beginning there again uh, to see things which are not that close to this kind of goal. So science, I mentioned science fiction. There have been a number of versions of uh, the, these ideas. For example, uh, we all remember uh, the 2001 A Space Odyssey computer. How, let's hope, the non-human non form of intelligence of smart city will not behave like how. Uh, another version uh, that may seem more f even more unprobable, which is from a pretty mediocre, actually, science fiction novel in which there is one interesting idea, which is in the future, the city of Los Angeles, you can pretty much meet with her individually because she is present close to every citizen as an electronic avatar, especially at the moment of tax uh, perception. Um, so that might seem completely utopian, but at the same time, it's very striking the number of cities which are developing tools which will enable citizens to interact with the city at an individual level. To give a couple of examples, Boston is developing such tools, Bordeaux in France, and there are many others. So what seems very far-fetched is actually not uh, that uh, uh, far away from some aspect of reality. So there is something utopian for sure, but there is also a lot of reality. We are in a mix, actually, of utopia and reality. So to, what I'm going to try to do is try a little bit to disentangle the, that mix to unpack this complex blend of ideals and realistic perspective. And that, should, and that will lead me to a few considerations on what intelligent may mean apply to future cities. So I'm going there again, sorry about that, but I cannot help to propose a pretty complex itinerary. First, um, um, I will begin by the technological infrastructure proper, but then try to reveal that there are actually two competing visions these days of smart cities. One is a neo-cybernetic project of rational steering of the city, a pretty authoritarian project in essence, the second is a more democratic one based on the idea of empowering individuals. So my hypothesis will be that the future of smart cities is actually probably a blend between these two projects, a kind of neo-cybernetic orientation and something more grassroots, bottom-up, if you like. And uh, I will also argue that maps are maybe probably one of the key expression today, mapping, urban maps, maybe one of the key expression of what's taking place in this domain of smart cities. And finally, I'll discuss 
uh, also the limits of this question, this approach of smart cities. Throughout this lecture, there is one question that will come again and again, and which has given its title to this lecture, which is how can design contribute to these, the smart cities? There again, it's a complex question, and there is no straightforward answer. But one thing to note, and this is very striking for me, is how absent architects have been so far from the debates about smart cities. Architects have been extremely present and vocal on digital, on the use of the computers in architecture, digital fabrication, etc. On smart cities, they are not that present. Uh, more generally, I'm always struck by the kind of disconnection between the debates on digital architecture and digital culture and the discussion that has developed at an urban scale. So it does not mean that architecture is not part of the smart city development. I will argue that actually a lot of trends in architecture are linked to these developments of smart cities. But what I'm advocating is probably a more conscious take on how important this question has become. Uh, one of the reasons being also that, you know, it's not all about endorsing a bright new future, a brave new world. It's also being able to develop critique, to develop a critical sense, and architecture has an irreplaceable role to play in that respect. So let me begin by first, I mentioned um, the mix of utopia and reality. This might be related to what is very probably a, a kind of unique feature of uh, digital technology, which is one, the role of fiction, and more precisely, the role of self-fulfilling fiction. There is this very famous formula that, you know, in order to predict the future, you have actually to invent it. Uh, and it's especially true in the field of digital technology. You take, for example, all the, all the developments we've known in the past uh, five to ten years around what has become known as pervasive computing or ambient computing, the idea that computing is no longer only in your computer, it surrounds you, the digital is almost part of the air you breathe through wireless, etc., and of course the Google, Gla Google Glass are part of this evolution. What is very striking is that actually we may think that this is a natural development, it's actually a project that is born pretty early on and developed as early as the, uh, the beginning of the 1990s by uh, Silicon Valley uh, gurus like Mark Weiser who evoke this idea of ambient computing as a project. And uh, Mark Weiser, interestingly, he writes a very seminal article on what computing could be in the 21st century and he uses a fiction by telling a story about somebody who wakes up and how the, per the person lives in this new digital environment, et cetera, et cetera. So this links, this is linked for me to another thing, self-fulfilling fiction, and the fiction aspect is very important. Uh, let, speaking of, you know, all that is happening today, think of the role of a film like Minority Report in which you have all kinds of interesting exchanges between the, the, the team of the film and people from the tech industry. And uh, it's quite typical in some ways of this kind of very strange relation between fiction and uh, technological progress. In summary, my take would be that smart cities do exist because we want them to exist. They are typically a self-fulfilling fiction. It's to a, a certain extent still a fiction, but so many people are trying to make the story true that actually it's happening. So uh, uh, it's happening. And I would even go as far as to say so many people also now are persuaded that artificial intelligence, etc., is the next step, that this is also probably going to happen. So now let's go back to the kind of technological basis. What is a smart city? Primarily, it's a city based on the multiplication of sensors, computer chips, a lot of equipment like that, that enable to know a lot of things about city and trigger, if needed, reaction. So to give a couple of examples, we, we, as you know, you can now know the consumption of electricity, water, whatever. In Paris, for example, the trees are monitored, there are computer chips in the trees, and you can follow uh, and enter information, etc. This is also related to an uh, open data 
uh, you can actually know uh, the state of the trees in Paris, etc. It's quite typical of this evolution. Take also all the things pertaining to circulation. We, for the first time, live in cities in which we can track pretty much uh, everywhere the state of the traffic. Uh, we can dynamic pricing, like in Singapore, where you pay pretty much uh, you know, the price of the road change, the tolls changes every quarter of an hour. All these things are actually happening and they are linked to this multiplication of captors, etc. Going even further, one may even imagine that we may track trash one of these days. The sensible lab at MIT has imagined, has made a couple of experiments on this idea to try to understand the circulation of trash. One thing to note is a multiplication of captures and also the fact that a lot of this information is not only produced uh, by machines, etc., it's produced by people. And the central importance of people, of consumer, etc., why? Because each time you put a car in an ATM machine, it's each time you take public transportation, etc., you are tracked. And this is becoming more and more central to the perspective of the smart city. Uh, staying with a trash problem, you know, there are lots of experiments all over the world around, you know, an idea there again of pri making pay people pay uh, for the, their exact use of the, tr uh, the trash uh, system. This is, for example, uh, a smart waste container in Seoul in which you wait what you're throwing away and you are built directly and a lot of people are thinking about these things. I don't know whether it's a dream by the way or a nightmare but that's another story. We'll come back to that. Uh, of course what is behind that is that cities are, p are places where space is rare, a lot of resources are rare and for example smart cities all over the world from San Francisco to Nice parking is a big subject these days. How to manage in a more dynamic, intelligent way parking. You even have people who are beginning to think that we could have a dynamic market of parking slots price and that you could actually, for example, enter into your car, I'm ready to park for such an amount of money and, uh, and circle uh, until the moment you reach your price. So all kinds of things are going on in that respect. Of course, the problem behind is that there is a formidable multiplication of things we can track and how to integrate is a big question. And this is where people like IBM, Cisco, Siemens, etc. come and say, we're going to help you integrate. This is, for example, a project for a connected boulevard in Nice uh, by Cisco, uh, which is quite typical of that. So that is actually already linked to what I call the neo-cybernetic temptation. I'll come back to that. But let's note immediately that this is counterbalanced by the fact that the most emblematic machine, a piece of equipment in the smart city, is actually not the computer, not even the sensor. It's the smartphone. And probably smart cities, one of the reasons cities are becoming smart is because of smartphones. So it's as stupid as that. So. At that point, what I'd like to suggest is what seems to be taking place is a sort of activation of multiple points in space. As if, you know, in a traditional cities, you have a number of points which send back information, but not that many. What's happening today, it's as if millions of points were sending back information about water consumption, presence of vehicles, vehicles uh, presence of people, uh, etc., etc. A kind of activation, uh, which, uh, as if you know, space was becoming sentient. It is very striking to observe that this converge with another thing, which is the sentient and the sensory. The idea that this, the smart city is also supposed to be a city in which the senses are heightened, are a, they're a cities of excitation. And that meets with, uh, I, I say that design has been going in these, uh, in, in these ways. Think of the exhibition put together and the catalog by Mirko Zardini a few years ago uh, on precisely the, that was precisely called Sense of the, the City. I would say the sentient city, the city that multiplies information, is also interestingly a city in which sensory simulation matters more and more. 
I'll come back to why but, uh, in a moment, but this is, uh, well, I can tell you also why. Now, it's also very much linked to what is often called the economy of knowledge, the idea of intelligent people wanting to have fun, excitation, etc., in cities. So, their uh, design has connected with that without always realizing that this is actually part of the smart city. Let's think of all these contributions of uh, uh, design and very often digitally inspired design to restaurant, the fooding culture, shopping, etc., etc. This is really linked to the rise of what Richard Florida has called the creative class. And I don't know whether some of you know Kendall Square at MIT, but it's interesting that the, this is probably the most boring place in Cambridge. And interestingly, it's so boring that MIT is getting worried because they have the dot com, but they fear that the people will not be happy. So this is, it's kind of frightening again, but this is the project of transformation uh, of Kendall Square to make it a vibrant place, etc. Uh, so, which is very much linked to this idea of sensory simulation, pastries, elegant shops, etc., etc. So, we have by the end, I would suggest the dimension of a sensitive and sensory city. And it's important to think of both, which is very much related also to the fact that digital culture is more and more addressing the senses. Think of all the, the fact that the tactility now of digital culture, all these aspects do matter. And you, Maristella mentioned the, the work I did on ornament. It's very striking how the, the, the use of ornament by contemporary architecture has been very much following this line. For example, the tactility of ornament, even if you don't touch it directly, this is the uh, Herzog and de Beron de Young Museum, or in the case of Evan Douglas, an even more traveling relation between the visual and the gustative. It looks like an Italian ice cream. Uh, uh, and there, there is really in the often mentioned return of ornament today something that is very linked to this question of the sensory city. Uh, and it's interesting also that digital fabrication today has a link with this question of sensation. This is what you typically find. It looks like a Gaudi vault, but this is actually one of these ornamental production we see today. So let me move with my next point. In a city that gets activated in every and each of its points, in a city that becomes more and more dominated by what you experience, what you feel, etc., etc., another way to formulate that would be to say the city, in the city, what happens become more and more important. A city is less a place than actually a multiplication of possibilities of things that happen, a kind of scintillation of events. From the very minute event, you, and the digital tools are all about that. When you have a blue dot on a map, and the I'm here uh, kind of thing is a micro event. When you know when the train or the bus is going to arrive, that's another kind of event. And then if you go to larger and larger sequences, the state of the traffic, for example, in the right corner, at uh, the bottom, this is the state of the traffic in Paris uh, with a digital tool called Citadin. Every city has this kind of thing today. And this is actually about some a situation, something that happens. So, philosopher Paul Virilio, a few years ago, had already uh, remarked that. But Virilio, being a very dramatic person, he thought only of what happens in terms of huge catastrophes. What I would suggest is actually that this activation of the city goes with a kind of perception of the city as event, occurrences, and scenario. With a kind of big displacement, it's really striking how event today are more often, more and more often mobilized instead of classical urban plan in order to think of the future of this city. For example, in Paris, Paris-Plage, which is maybe seen as a pretty ridiculous event, but actually it was intimately linked to the reflection of the municipality on the long-term planning of circulation in central Paris. And, uh, and why? Because actually event may trigger scenario, and there is a greater and greater tendency to think of cities in terms of scenario. Am I clear so far? Good, so let's move on. So that explains another thing, which is why 
urban scenario has been thriving. When London, for example, the city of London presented this view of London in year 2000 and something like the new Shanghai of Europe, this was a scenario. Uh, more than a plan. And very often this vision today, which explains also why filmmakers have been instrumental in so many urban debates, etc., this, the future of cities is more and more often thought under those terms. So to return to architecture, architecture, star architecture especially in the past years, has been more and more conceived as events that are supposed to trigger scenario. So this is the Hadid in Baku, and actually the Hadid in Baku is understandable, only uh, related to the strategies of Baku that my colleague Yves Blau is studying these days, and, uh, the, and the kind of cultural strategy developed by the city in relation to the oil industry, etc., etc. And then we see how architecture becomes something that enables the right scenario. So of course, this big, where things are complex, this is actually also the legacy of the Guggenheim, the so-called Guggenheim effect. But this is a very strong aspect which has completely redefined the role of architecture in the city. So what I would argue that the Guggenheim is one of the root, but the other root is actually the fact that, and this is a bit complicated, but digital culture that with computers, you don't see things you tend to see more occurrences and events. It's actually quite striking that the first time you began to see something on screens leaked to computer, it was potential strikes from the USSR in the semi-automated ground system, which was the first anti-missile system of the US and the first large computer network were in the 1950s. And later, what you tracked with computer were situation from you know, military to financial situation. That may explain why, you know, uh, games is, has been one of the natural uh, outcome of digital culture. And by the way, with games, which very often has the kind of, uh, of urban component, and it has been often noted that there is a tendency now to also think of the city as a kind of giant game, and augmented reality has fostered this kind of idea, a place where you can leave traces, move uh, a little bit like in a game. So to conclude this section, I wanted to reach the point also to architecture as event, and the next stage might be architecture actually as a form of action. And this is what all the responsive architecture today is about. Uh, and this is also a very important aspect. So why did I insist on events, etc., games, etc.? Because the next stage, and this is where IBM, etc., comes a bit naturally, the next stage is to think, you know, if a city, it's a question of good events, scenario, etc., you know, this is a little bit like driving. You should drive properly the city, okay? And avoid bombs and avoid accidents because, and you know, uh, planning becomes like driving. And driving actually was at the bi basis of cybernetics, actually, kibernetic, because means the uh, good driving. And the idea that good driving, which is based on proper circuits of information, feedback loops, et cetera, et cetera, this is one of the key ideas developed by Norbert Wiener uh, at the end of the Second World War, and among other things in his famous book, Cybernetics and Control and Communication in the Animal, the animal and the Machine, with the idea that at the time, the idea of driving was mostly the big Norbert Wiener problem was how to drive sophisticated piece of military equipment, you know, planes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But very rapidly, as we will see, the idea went into the urban and actually pretty quickly. So the cybernetics had also a link to a, a character I'll come back to later, which is the cyborg, the idea that the best way finally to have good pilots is to embed the technology in the people. And uh, uh, something that Hollywood took, this is Robocop by Fairhoven, that's the 1980s, but actually the cyborg research started in the 1950s. Actually, my first book on these questions was uh, 15 years ago, something like that, a book on ur urbanism and cyborgs. One thing to note, the cyborg, this idea, uh, had a natural habitat, which were cockpits, but also operation rooms. 
an operation room, this is the NORAD, where places highly, uh, where cybernetic loops, etc., were supposed to be highly important. Why? Because it was about driving the idea. It was like the cockpit that enabled you to drive properly armies, airstrikes, etc., etc. So now this is a very powerful idea in the 1950s. And immediately, a number of urbanists and architects begin to want to translate that to cities with the idea that if we can really drive properly armies, big military projects, etc., why shouldn't we be able to drive cities in that way? And that leads, for example, I, I showed you a radar screen, Melville Branch, urbanist, who designs, you can see here, the proper way to steer a city with a good trajectory as if you were uh, uh, driving uh, a, an armor or flying uh, a bomber. So this kind of proper trajectory. And Melville Branch then, taking even more literally, has the idea to transform actually uh, the planning center of Los Angeles into an operation room in which you will have computer displays, etc., etc. So you might think we're in complete utopia. But I promised the picture from Rio de Janeiro when IBM, a few years ago, sold after a series of dramatic landslides an operation center to Rio de Janeiro in which you can coordinate the police, the weather forecast, uh, camera surveillance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What IBM, IBM is selling is actually the idea of the good driving of the city. Thanks to all these captors, et cetera, you're going to be able to drive the city much more efficiently because you'll know in real time what happens. You'll know what is the proper reaction. You will even have programs that will help you make the right decision. So this is where I arrive, you know, from this idea of events, et cetera, driving to my first big temptation behind the smart city, the idea of this, the, in, the intelligent expert system that is going to help you drive the city better, which is, of course, I'll return to that, a, a very technocratic thing. And there are a number of, no one completely believes in it, but when IBM or Cisco are selling their system, this is the promise they tend to make. One day, we will be able to drive cities, to pilot cities, like a complex uh, piece of equipment. So then the question becomes, what can be the form of intelligence if we take this idea of a, a, a kind of intelligence attached to the smart city? What kind of intelligence are we seeing emerging? So the answer. I won't be long, but the, one of the idea probably, and this is something that a lot of people have explored, Bill Mitchell, late Bill Mitchell from MIT, myself in my book on cyborg, but also Eric Swingadu in cyborg urbanism, Matthew Gandhi, etc. We all, by the end, believe that the future, if we take this kind of idea seriously, the future is partly about a kind of more intimate hybridization between man and technology and uh, actually which revolve around a changing human subject, which is much more intimately linked to technology. You may go even further. You have now people who are beginning to think about the biomonitoring of population. For example, you send, you know, we, we have the DNA, but we have also what is called the macrobiote, which is all the, uh, the proteins, various viruses, except bacteria that are on our skin, in our guts, etc. And if you can monitor that, you can actually make a lot of prediction about uh, epidemics, about health, the health of a population, etc. So you have people who just think, let's follow that. And to do that, let's just put intelligent captors in sewers. And there are researchers on that. There again, you might think it's completely science fiction, but Singapore, for example, when there was the avian flu, forced all its citizens to take their temperature every morning and to put it on the computer. The result was, however, that everybody was 737 uh, Celsius degree. But nevertheless, you may imagine one day in which your cell phone is actually to record your temperature and send it to some kind of central instance that monitors the health of the population. So a kind of cyborg biological assemblage, which might be uh, something tempting, at least for some people. I, I, I know it doesn't always sound reassuring. But um, what is important is to try to understand then 
what is the model of intelligence? A kind of alliance between artificial system and humans, which is typically what the cyborg was about. That's to say expert system plus human, augmented human intelligence, which is very much the model. But then if you think a bit further, the real problem of this approach is that, of course, people are promised that, you know, through augmented intelligence, they will have the mastery of their lives. But the real question becomes, who writes the code? Who determines the proper cyborg assemblage, etc.? And what you see emerging is the risk of a technocracy. The risk that, you know, if we were really to follow IBM's dream or Cisco's dream, there would be the one actually really making decisions in cities. Which is an old paranoia, but which uh, is actually coming back today under more peaceful appearances, uh, which is in a way the promise of the Republic of Plato, a cities in which everything is programmed events, properly managed to create happy scenario. As we know, usually happy scenario and badly, but that's another story. So fortunately, this is not the only thing that the digital does. This is far from being the only thing that the digital does. And there is a, the complete reverse model in which you abandon Cisco, IBM, etc., and you think empower individuals, individuals with spontaneity, possibilities of creation. And we have all the discourses about Twitter and the role in the Arabs' revolution, the flash mobs, etc., etc., and more cooperative vision, uh, of course, uh, that stem from that. What is it linked to this kind of big paradox of digital culture? Digital culture is about system and it's about individuals. And there is a constant battle between systems and individuals and the city of the future may be actually really something that will be about this battle again and again. So digital technology for sure plays a fundamental role in country individuality. For example, it enables you to, to know uh, if you really, it enables actually others to know if you are really who you're saying you are. And you know, uh, identity uh, assessment is a thriving business and will be more and more. It enables also to know where you are. And I spoke of that, the fact that we can track so many things, including where you are, is a profound revolution. And then it enables you to know all the nasty things you do or not nasty, but uh, although this is uh, interestingly, by the way, this is a monitored aggression, uh, and you may note that one of the guy aggressor is actually filming with his cell phone. And this is a little bit the world in which we live. So of course, behind that, we see another utopia, which is more grassroots. With empowered individuals, we can make a difference, we can create new cooperation. This is the Wikipedia model, if you like. And it's true that there are spectacular results. OpenStreetMap is now beginning to, to compete in terms of accuracy of urban maps with, uh, for example, the National Geographic Institute in France. What they still cannot do is the geodesy, but the, the maps, are actually more and more accurate, or fix my street, in which you can signal problems, and you know this kind of civic hacker kind of thing is actually proliferating. They are also somewhat utopian. For example, on fix my street, or rather on sorry, open street map, pretty much 90% of the maps are produced by 10% of the members. So we're far from the complete democracy, but it's important to notice that actually what is interesting today is that the smart city is a political field of battle between two very different visions of the city. So what I would argue is that actually the only way to understand this battle is precisely to take also into account the complexity of what is a digitally equipped individual, which is not so simple to characterize. On the one hand, it's a completely determined by super Power, commercial power, etc., individual. When you buy Rihanna on the Apple store, you're not exactly completely a free citizen. But as soon as you listen to Rihanna, uh, that's your choice. And actually, take Amazon also. We're both slaves of Amazon and empowered by Amazon. And this is what is difficult sometimes to understand. The cyborg 
is also both about power. Usually, we becoming cyborg is about trying to become a superhero, but superheroes need fixing. And actually, cyborgs also need repair. And this is another kind of ambiguity. So all that to say that we are actually in complex form of subjectivities today, which are not uh, which are not black and white, which are actually a mix of very contradictory features. And if you like, when we are subject to system, we are actually citizens of this kind of technocratic, neo-cybernetic project. When we assert our individuality, we are actually something else. What I want to reach out clearly, to do not to make a story, the story too long, is that probably the smart city you cannot think of it in one term or the other. For example, a metro system, it's probably better that it's not managed by empowered citizens. It's probably better managed in a neo-cybernetic way. So there are systems which are better like that. There are other systems which it's probably better not to manage in a neo-cybernetic way. And the form of intelligence of the smart city might be actually uh, the result of the kind of confrontation between these two very different models. To go back to the individual, the ultimate contradiction today is that it's no longer the cyborgs that is enough to think about it, because probably it's a more Deleuzean figure of somebody who is diffused, uh, who is no longer in the boundary of his body, his, her body, uh, who is multiple inside himself and outside its neuronal uh, it's a set of, of sorry, uh, um, neuronal synapses, but we are diverse, we are like ecologies. So to, uh, this is something Sherry Turkle and a lot of sociologists of the digital have explored, is how the digital dissolves the traditional boundary of our body, how we are in multiple places, multiple instances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there again, since I really like to complicate things, I would suggest actually something even more complicated which is the following, but I'll take a simple example, which is Facebook. On Facebook, on the one hand, you're not an isolated individual that can be thought completely in isolation. You are actually a point of view on, on Facebook or a node in something that goes beyond you. You're a partial ecology within Facebook, okay? But, so that would be my dissolution, etc. But on the other hand, on Facebook, you constantly reconstruct yourself as the hero you, living this unique life for all your friends and followers. So that actually, if you want to understand contrary individuality and the relation it has to the city, you have to imagine uh, an individual, a form of subjectivity that is sometimes you know, becoming diffused, dispersed almost with the city, and sometimes trying to reassemble itself he herself. Okay? I'll come back to that in a moment. So my next step would be to say a few words about what are probably two of the fundamental displacement that have made these smart city things possible beyond the chips, etc. One is definitely augmented reality. The fact that we live less and less in the physical or the electronic world, we live in a mix. And ambient computing that I mentioned at the beginning, ambient computing is typically something that goes with augmented reality, with the fact that we're constantly actually processing flows of matter and bits of information. And this is becoming more and more the urban reality. And so augmented reality begins with teenagers, or even myself sometimes, uh, walking in the street and looking at their uh, telephone and you know, people texting, etc. This is augmented reality, and this is more and more the urban condition. Augmented reality has a lot of application, commercial, etc. Let's mention tourism. Uh, the city of Cluny, a few years ago, they have one of what, uh, the ruins of what was the largest Romanist church ever built in Western Europe, and they recreated virtually the church for the visitors. Now, by the way, it's no longer with fixed shields. You can get it on your iPad. So there again, tells you a lot on how this is moving. What I would argue is that augmented reality, in a way, 
participate to this regime of dissolution. Because in a world in which the, it's not only about atoms, it's about atoms and bits of information, and bits of information flow from you. They are not you. They are what connects you, etc. That participate to this regime of you know, extended, if you like, or dispersed uh, individuality. Now, the, this raises a number of important questions for architecture. So far, we have barely begun to scratch the surface of the problem. And speaking of surface, 90% still of the answer are about screens. But screen is not the definitive answer for one reason also, is that we may very well enter a digital world in which there are no longer classical screen. Uh, if the Google Glass, for example, become a kind of new common wear, you know, this will be meaningless. Uh, so screens are no longer. Another thing we might want to rethink is that it's not always about, you know, putting gizmos or whatever. It's about the quality of space linked to uh, the fact that there are digital windows on another reality or a mix of bits and atoms. For me, that was one of the great interests of the, the, the computer room of the ICA of uh, De Laurent's Coffee Deal was to, in a way, insist on the fact that in a digital world, you need to dramatize space. So that space brings back something that is unique to physical space. Because there are so many things you can do better in the digital world. So, and I think for me, this is an important lesson. For me, by the way, one of the major source uh, fields of exploration will be higher education. You've all heard, you've all heard about the MOOCs, etc. One thing is sure, spatially, university will have to shrink. But it doesn't mean that space will not matter. To the contrary, it will mean two things. First, probably less classrooms, but classrooms will be super important and we'll do in classroom things we cannot do online. So what is, are the characteristics of the space? There will be places of meeting, places of symbolic value, etc. Second, how do we redesign also the space when people tend to live? You, you know, everyone who teaches here in this room knows that students, they do whatever they do uh, while listening to a class, which means that they live, they're here and not here. So that's also a problem. How do you redesign space, etc., for this kind of strange condition? So all that to, and all that to, to say that th this is getting uh, augmented reality is uh, something absolutely fundamental to the future of design, and barely things have barely begun. The other thing we tend to take for granted and natural is geolocalization. And by the way, the, the real strength of the whole system is that you don't have only augmented reality and geolocalization, you have both. You take Minority Report there again when Tom Cruise was walking and the advertisement was changing according to where he was in space. This is what happens with augmented reality plus geolocalization. In geolocalization, there is a tendency to underestimate how dramatic a change it is to be for the first time able to track so many things in space, beginning with you. So I, if I say, you know, augmented reality tends to dissolve your boundaries, strangely, geolocalization brings you back to this unique point in space where your body is and in relation to other bodies, etc. So this kind of pulsation between the kind of diffusion and the recentering on oneself is actually well embodied in this kind of strange couple between augmented reality, the dissolving factor, if you like, and geolocalization that recenters on physical objects and where they are in space. So interestingly, by the way, geolocalization has been from the start something artists saw the potential. Let me mention uh, you know, Laura Kurgan, and he, in 1995, or, you know, Belasco Rogers, who walked uh, with a GPS for years, that's his seven years drawing Berlin uh, through his displacement, uh, which goes back to this idea that what is a city today? It's not a plan. It's, a, it's, the, it's actually the global scenario of a multiple millions of micro events, like where was I uh, in that moment, etc. All that to arrive to this paradox that very often smart cities are pre presented as the other of design. But it's actually, we are actually entering into a highly spatialized form 
of intelligence. That's to say, if we take this smart city literally, actually what's happening, the form of intelligence is deeply spatial because it's about points in space activated and linked to electronic content, etc. So, and it's interesting, by the way, that speaking of spatialized intelligence, we read more and more our own brain, not as a single unified computer, but as a network, as a network in which there is space, there are connections, there are zones, etc. This is the Blue Brain Project of Lausanne, uh, which is typical of this kind of new internet-like vision of the brain. So now let's go to the big paradox of this whole thing. We are actually probably in a, in a, a very heightened, very, imp, very high level of spatial uh, existence uh, with smart cities, but at the same time, urban form has not been touched. And the projects that very often present themselves as sophisticated in terms of smart city thing are very conservative in terms of urban form. You know, Mazdar is not, frankly, whatever one says, a super, uh, you know, new thing. Songdo is even worse. Songdo is the, 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 the description, by the way, given by the promoters was a mix of Central Park, the Parisian Boulevard, and the Venetian Canals, which is not exactly a cutting edge a kind of new relation. So I would arrive to the, the following, and I'm, which is that so far, we are in this paradox of a way city are going to be, which is going to be more and more spatial with an activation of millions of points of space and very little consequence so far on the urban form. That's part of the paradox. I don't think the paradox is going to last forever, but that's something we, we have to take into account. If I had prediction, but historians usually are bad prophets, but I'll still risk a prediction, I would say that probably with a smart city, for example, if you take an Osmanian boulevard, I live on what is probably one of the most regular avenues of Paris, the Boulevard Sébastopol, in which in some ways the map, the boulevard, the boulevard is a system of information to tell you where you are. If you have the red dot or the blue dot of a cell phone, you don't need to embody, to use the city, uh, you know, in order to help you know where you are. To go a bit further, you may wonder whether you still need something like urban composition, whether you should not reinvent forms of complexities which are closer to traditional practices of the vernacular. Uh, this is Jodhpur. And I was thinking architecture there again. You know, strangely, the capacity of architecture to anticipate evolution takes the fashion, the passion for stacking today. And the idea that precisely the traditionally compositional might not be, and you're beginning to see the first projects of urban stacking. Uh, there is something perhaps going on in that respect. So I'm nearing the end, and I'd like to do two things. The first is to talk about maps as briefly as possible, but with the following thing. What strikes me so far is that, of course, design is anticipating, but what is changing very quickly are urban representations. And not only because of information, geographic information system, but we are in an explosion of mapping track practices. And one of the contribution of design, if you think of what design has done in the past 20 years, design has become extremely good at mapping. And, and this is one of the places also where designers should be involved, actually thinking about the new representation of the city. I'm taking representation, I use representation because representation, especially in French, but also I think in English, has a double and ambiguous uh, thing. One is pictorial re or cartographic representation, and the other is political representation. Okay? And what I would argue that maps may very well be today the field in which this kind of adjustment between the bottom up and top down uh, approach to the smart cities taking place. You do have, what has happened with maps is actually an explosion. There again, we don't realize it, but we produce now billions of maps. Everyone can produce a map using a Google map, etc. This is a revolution, whatever one says. With also things that have become completely banal for us, but for example, monitoring and mapping 
become the same thing. This is the, the police headquarters in Paris, and you have a map in the middle, and you have screens, and this is part of the same thing. Speaking of monitoring and mapping, this is the control room, very cybernetic, of the water system of Paris, the SAGEP, and uh, this is a control room, and this is a map, and this is also a monitoring system. So this is very typical of the top-down, the kind of map you would find in an operation room if you like. The with a big difference today that you don't need necessarily an operation room or you a situation room, you can have that on your laptop if you're authorized to. Top down also, strangely, if you know where people are, what are, etc., you can do like my colleague Carlo Ratti from MIT and map, for example, uh, the density of people going to a concert of Madonna in Rome and uh, uh, through the position of their cells and the number of calls they give. A lot of people do that today. This is another from an European lab. This actually the position of people during uh, the European uh, Soccer Cup in Barcelona and their multiplication of things. This is the really top down, the maps that you should be able to, to have in order to monitor the city. But what is interesting is that the other approach to the city has also generated its kind of counter maps. You have, for example, and I mentioned the role of design in Laura Kurgan, uh, the interesting maps drawn by Laura Kurgan, what she called the million dollar blocks, which is typical of what you can do today. Today you have open data and you can know from where, what was the last address of criminals imprisoned by the federal state in the US. And then you can calculate those blocks in which the cost, annual cost of putting these people in prison is beyond a million dollars. And then you have an interesting geography of the city, which may be full of critical dimension. You have all these people working on emotional map, like Chris and Nod. You equip people to, in order to record what's happening to them, and you begin actually to draw an emotional map. What it is, it's actually the situationist come true. Exactly. But guess what? The situation is the city as a system of events. It's very inspiring and in tune with what's happening today. So all that to say, why are maps so crucial? Because maps, first of all, they are about power. Is it top down? Is it bottom up? They are also about a more insidious form of power. Is It's because the, the world of data is not a world you can visualize as such. You need actually to format them and to make them visible. And map prescribe what can be, ma be made visible and for whom. This is a map, actually a 3D model of the city of Rennes in the west of France, and on which you, the municipality positioned the, the new projects for public debate. But maps today, very often urbanism today, it's more about knowing who has access to what kind of maps and who can discuss it, which is, of course, linked to the visibility of, da of data. Uh, this is what philosopher Rancière used to call the uh, regime esthétique, aesthetic regimes, were right into that question, who's allowed to see what? And with really this idea that maps might be today the closest form of, uh, you know, the, the most intelligent form we have produced related to the smart city. So, which is why so many wiki kind of things are around map. Let's think of open street map, etc. Maps are highly political. I almost put a map of crime, but this is a map of noise. If you pr produce a map of noise in a French city today, there is literally an uproar. Because, of course, all the people who live and want to send, sell apartments where it's really purple have problems. And so we are in these questions of politics. So for me, basically, I would say two things to conclude this section, and then I'll come to the conclusion. First, smart cities will probably be cities in which you have islands of neo-cybernetic neo controls, and ideally an ocean, an ocean of collaborative, individually driven, etc., initiative. This is how, if the future uh, is optimistic, this is where it should be. Maps may very well be today one of the levels at which this kind of adjustment is trying to take place, because maps are about both and about how they both meet. So that would be, they, would, they are probably where utopia is actually meeting reality. 
Uh, now, as I'm a very yes and no person, I would conclude by, uh, I'll pass on that, by what I would call the limits of intelligence. The fact that, you know, the, the smart city is a wonderful thing, et cetera, et cetera, even if it's scary, but it raises a number of problems which are far from being solved. First one, of course, is sustainability. Because we all function with a rosy dream that cities are going to be more sustainable because they are smart. It's not probably wrong, but I, I suppose you all noted when there was this article which basically told you that your iPhone consumes more energy than a refrigerator, and that actually now the cloud takes, needs more energy than uh, civil aviation. There are problems, uh, even if a lot of technological experts still think that this sustainability will need the digital. There are also problems of recycling, etc., which are far from being solved. Basically, you know, the fundamental principle of recycling materials is basically the less you hybridize and create composite, etc., the better you are. So you should never glue, you should never, etc. Actually, pretty much all the computer chips, etc., they're uh, unprocessable hybrids of materials, and this is a real problem. There are other problems, is that there is a tendency to believe that smart cities are for smart people, but meaning with a very restrictive definition of smart, as Harvard, MIT, possibly Cornell, McGill, and not, of course, your everyday person. Uh, and guess what, cities, uh, and if you read Edward Glazer in Economy, Richard Florida, etc., this is all about these new creative people, but there are a lot of people who are not creative, uh, and uh, that's normal, fortunately for the creative one, by the way. So what do we do with those? So far, the smart city thing has been often, you know, take MIT, etc., around, you, you know, uh, prices of real estate are driving uh, normal people away. And that's the typical problem of San Francisco these days, et cetera, et cetera. There is a problem. Uh, can we have a smart industrial city, for example? Can we have, et cetera? That's a big question. There are deeper question now, even deeper. One is linked, I mentioned this culture of events, occurrences, et cetera. It's a kind of culture of the news. Everything is always supposed to happen. And then what happens is that you begin to have the impression to live in an everlasting present in which history is suspended because there's always something that happens. Which is, by the way, one of the earliest representation that cyberpunk fiction had of the internet. Something that was not a classically historical condition but a little bit like the Las Vegas Strip. In the Las Vegas Strip, in some ways, nothing happens and everything constantly happens. And that might be, in some ways, the biggest trap of the smart city, is how is it going to recon with history, with changing condition, etc. And I announced at the beginning a, a challenge for design. One of the things I do believe, actually, is that history and more uh, architecture and more generally design have an enormous role to play to rehistoricize this project. Because one thing we know as architect, urbanist, etc., about cities, is that cities have to age. Cities have to accommodate conflicting and contrasted situation. Cities are palimpsest. They are not pieces of software program written once and for all. They are more like windows in that respect than anything else. They are palimpsest. And the question is also to know how to insert oneself in this palimpsest and also how to reframe its meaning, etc. And for me, strangely, the question of smart city at the end is as much a question about meaning, about the relation to history, etc., than a question of technology. Is how to enable smart city to age. Because, uh, and this is, by the way, one of the general problems of the digital, is that the relation to aging is difficult. You take archive. Most traditionally, you found a room not too humid, you put paper in it, and you wait to, waited 200 years, and you opened it to historians. Uh, that was a good way. Today, with hard disk, you never know if the hard disk is not going to fail. Is the PDF format going to be still readable in 2050? 
Is it still going to be the good format? With the, uh, the, the uh, archaeology of the digital, see already the problems we have with formats of the 1990s and uh, 1980s. So all these questions, in a way, we haven't yet been able to think of the digital uh, in relation to aging, etc. And that's probably one of the questions Smart City will confront us to. Thank you. de situation dans l'espace Non, j'ai essayé de dire deux choses. Il m'arrive parfois d'essayer de dire deux en une, donc c'est pas forcément, ça a besoin d'un peu d'unpacking. Je peux parler français, c'est bon Bon, euh, j'ai essayé de dire deux choses. La première, c'est qu'on est face à une espèce de spatialisation de l'information et de l'intelligence. C'est-à-dire que la smart city, c'est vraiment, et c'est pour ça que j'ai aussi parlé au début d'Ambient Computing, c'est ce qui se passe lorsque réellement le numérique au lieu d'être dans des machines et dans des réseaux qui étaient hors du monde, devient de plus en plus dans le monde physique. Okay Donc, et dans, dans lequel, finalement, le, le « où » devient une, très, une question très importante. On le voit même, d'ailleurs, dans les circuits financiers, où être près des serveurs devient un truc stratégique. Donc ça, c'est une première chose. Là-dessus, je disais, curieusement quand même, on n'est pas encore arrivé à faire correspondre à ça de nouvelles formes d'organisation de l'espace. C'est tout. Et je disais, et, pa, et par contre, l'hypothèse qu'on peut peut-être faire sur l'évolution des villes, c'est qu'on a moins besoin d'autrefois. Les villes, autrefois, devaient être à la fois des systèmes de lecture et puis des villes. Mais il y avait un côté, la ville est la carte. Aujourd'hui, vous n'avez plus besoin de la même façon, par exemple, et du coup, la question de la composition urbaine se pose différemment, par exemple. Vous pouvez très facilement... Les grandes perspectives baroques, etc., étaient aussi des façons... De, 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 de permettre aux gens de se repérer, enfin, etc. Aujourd'hui, on a de moins en moins besoin de ça, et, etc. Donc, vous pouvez imaginer qu'en fait, et là aussi, l'architecture l'a anticipé, ça fait à peu près 20-30 ans que l'architecture se pose la question de la composition. Enfin, à part en France, où on est dans, dans, dans le truc le plus invraisemblablement euh, euh, retardataire, mais, mais à part la France, il euh, y a beaucoup dans de pays qui se posent ces questions de composition. Et... Euh, et donc, il n'est pas dit, tout ce que je voulais dire, c'est qu'il n'est pas... On peut imaginer que la forme urbaine se mette à évoluer très vite, une fois que ces choses-là vont se généraliser. Philippe, ça avait une question. Alors, et ensuite, je, on vous a Merci pour cette conférence tout à fait fascinante. Je voulais vous demander, ce grand plan de Paris qu'on qu prépare, qu'on... On discute pas Paris, c'est Paris région, n'est-ce pas Oui. Et euh, on, on, il y avait beaucoup d'informations là-dessus il y a quelques années, et maintenant on entend, au moins j'entends plus rien là-dessus. Mais est-ce que, est -ce que cette, euh, cette planification euh, qui, qui, qui est évidemment impliquait des historiens et toutes tout, tout, tout sortes d'autres, je suppose, euh, mmh. euh, euh, disciplines est-ce que est, ça existe toujours Est-ce est qu'ils sont en train de regarder ça comme une, une, une histoire de Smart City Alors, deux choses. La première, ça continue. Bon, il ne vous a pas échappé que la France était dans une crise politique, économique et sociale quand même assez profonde, donc dans laquelle, je dirais, les, les questions de survie quotidienne, parfois, ont tendance à occuper le devant de la scène. Mais oui, les questions du Grand Paris continuent. Et oui, la question numérique est une des... Il y a un appel d'offres actuellement sur les questions du Grand Paris autour de l'économie numérique et autour de ces questions-là. C'est clairement... Euh, en France, il y a eu... Alors c'est assez marrant parce que les Français sur la forme urbaine sont très réactionnaires, mais l'évolution des villes est très très rapide. Il n'y a pas que Paris, il y a par exemple Rennes et depuis longtemps en pointe, Montpellier, à pratiquement toutes les villes de quelque importance actuellement des stratégies Smart Cities euh, qui sont aussi liées, bon j'en ai pas parlé parce qu'on ne peut pas parler de tout, mais les espaces de coworking comme on dit, il y a, il y a toutes ces questions-là aujourd'hui. Mais oui, oui, c'est tout à fait présent actuellement dans les débats, à Paris mais partout ailleurs. On peut dire Lyon a des stratégies numériques également, etc. Thanks for the... Very interesting presentation. Um, 
my question is essentially the implications of, of all of this for, uh, for architecture and urbanism. It's part of the, you know, the kernel of this idea is essentially the, the singularity, right? The Stuart Brand idea that humans and computers will essentially fuse and become one kind of artificial intelligent beings. Um, and smart cities is really just the scaling up of this idea that not people, not groups of people, but cities, you could even scale up to the globe. But um, the, uh, there's a kind of allegory of the, uh, the Faraday Cafe among new, uh, new media people that mm -hmm. in a world where everything is tracked, everybody is surveilled constantly, um, and you know, everybody is always known that the only way, the only place that you will be able to go to get out of this is uh, Faraday cafes or where they're lined with copper where waves mm -hmm. can't get in. But of course, when you're then off the grid, people know you're in a Faraday cafe. So it's a kind of, you know, you can never really escape this. And so this has real spatial implications for, for architecture. If architecture is then just relegated to uh, event planners or sort of facilitators of flashes in the pan or spectacle, you know, is this kind of a Debordian nightmare or do you think architecture and, and also the implication for the city kind of will adapt in a good way or, I mean, okay. I'd like to be okay. optimistic, but. It's a long question. Uh, on the first, strangely, I'm not an adept of the singularity, the kind of Kurzweil thing, because first of all, we have already a number of non-human form of intelligence. Take democracy. Democracy is not a human being. It's a collective. So what I think, I'm not interested in a kind of fusion between man and machine. I'm more interested in how the digital will enable us to construct different kind of community and global intelligence. I don't necessarily believe in the omega point, uh, that kind of thing, if you want. Second, I'm not that pessimistic because, first of all, do not forget that most of us do not really matter. So, frankly, you don't need to be in a Faraday cage because they're not even an observer. So, uh, you know, that's the, the paranoia begins to, that's very often what I tell my PhD student to make them more relaxed with their dissertation. Don't forget that nobody cares. But <laughs> <laughs> some of them can testify in this room. Uh, so, there is already that protection. Now, where I'm completely with you, however, is that I do believe that one of the function of architecture is not to open all the doors and windows to, to digital data, digital flows, that just like architecture protects from rain, I wrote actually that in my previous book on digital culture and architecture, in which I, I made the hypothesis that one of the function of architecture would be also sometimes to protect you from the flow of data. Not always, because you usually, uh, your level of resistance to having no bar on your cell phone is very limited, uh, you know, but uh, sometimes architecture can do that. Just like, you know, just think of a meeting in which people would be forbidden to text, the, how the quality would be improved. You know, so architecture, one of its tasks may very well be just like it manages pretty brilliantly privacy and public and with all kind of gradation to manage this kind of thing. For example, I'm, I don't, given the type of subject I manage, I never forbid the use of computer in, during my classes. I try just to make it as hard as possible to go on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> Or, uh, but, but nevertheless, it, it, it is clear that one of the things we will have to, to, to think, I think education will be actually higher education, a lab for urban uses. Because for example, I, I think if in the future we meet one-tenth of what we used to meet uh, today, it means that if you meet with a professor in real flesh, etc., uh, at some point, it's not to be texting. Whereas today we live in today, we have to also to not forget that we live in a luxury of human presence. If everything goes with MOOCs, etc., etc., it means that we will have to redefine what it means to be physically engaged in a meeting, etc., etc. So yes, architecture has a role to think about that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not all about transparency, putting screens everywhere, etc. Actually, what I like with the De Laurent's Coffidio was their proposal that actually the dramatic vision of the sea should be as interesting as the screen. Um, 
Merci, merci pour votre conférence. Et vous n'avez pas beaucoup, ou j'aimerais un peu plus vous entendre sur, sur euh, le, le, quasiment, enfin je ne sais pas si c'est clair, mais sur le leurre des, des smart cities. Ça veut dire qu'on on offre de l'information, tout le monde pourrait s'en emparer, alors que comme vous l'avez dit, finalement très peu ont le pouvoir de, de manipuler ces informations. Mais est-ce que, est -ce que ce n'est pas euh, le leurre de la, la démocratie et trop d'informations, tue l'information, qui peut s'en occuper Et est-ce que ça va vraiment changer les villes Parce que vous, vous esquissez des conclusions, mais vous ne les donnez pas, pas vraiment. Ah, je suis prudent, hein Oui, oui, parce qu'effectivement, vous dites que la forme urbaine n'a pas tellement changé. Mais du coup, la forme urbaine, c'est du pérenne, ça dure. Est-ce que les smart cities, c'est vraiment quelque chose qui va fondamentalement changer euh, la structure de la société Merci. Bah, disons, c'est quand même... Vous savez, comme on ne sait pas très bien si on va survivre au 22e siècle, c'est dur de faire des, précisions, des prédictions quand même. Euh... Ce que je pense, petit 1, quand je parlais d'historicité, je crois que les, la, la smart city, ça va être déjà dans un premier temps une réinterprétation de la ville existante qui est réhabitée de l'intérieur. Paris est une smart city déjà entre les arbres, les télés levées, de l'eau, des compteurs, des machins, etc. C'est une forme de smart city à et elle ressemble à une ville haussmanienne, mais c'est en même temps une, for, une smart city. Bon, donc il va y avoir ça. Euh, ce que je disais sur la forme urbaine, je pense que c'est beaucoup plus dans la dynamique d'évolution des villes qu'on n'est pas obligé, par exemple. Ça ouvre aussi des perspectives, malgré tout, euh, sur euh, bon, la, la, la croissance urbaine future. C'est-à-dire qu'on n'est plus forcément obligé de faire de l'osmanisation, par exemple, ou des choses de ce genre. Ça ouvre... Cela dit, il ne faut pas oublier, c'est peut-être chez moi le côté ingénieur des ponts et chaussées plus que... La, 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 les vraies limites urbaines aujourd'hui, c'est beaucoup plus l'assainissement que les téléphones. C'est très frappant en Inde, il y a beaucoup de smartphones partout, il n'y a pas de chiottes. Et, et c'est quand même le plus gros problème des villes indiennes. C'est les égouts, finalement. Donc c'est pour ça que je pense que, bon, il faut... C'est pour ça aussi que j'ai une vision qui est plutôt... En fait, j'ai une... derrière la tête, ce que j'ai un peu déjà en termes d'intelligence, c'est un peu comme notre cerveau fonctionne avec des trucs qui sont complètement pilotés automatiquement et des choses qui nous donnent plus des impressions de libre arbitre, etc. Je pense que la Smart City, ça risque de ressembler à quelque chose comme ça. Je pense que de la même façon, tout le monde ne sera pas associé à la Smart City de la même façon. Cela dit on va quand même vers des générations un petit peu plus à l'aise avec ces choses-là. Mais par exemple, un problème dont on ne parle pas, on, euh, bon, on, on a maintenant des tranches entières de la population qui sombrent dans les, les maladies liées à la vieillesse. Et euh, la smart city pour vieux, par exemple, on ne sait pas faire actuellement. Euh, bon, euh, on a beaucoup de problèmes de ce genre. Donc euh, c'est vrai que j'essaye d'être prudent. Moi, ce que je pense profondément, c'est vrai que je pense que ça va... Je pense deux choses. Je pense qu'il faut prendre intelligence de façon très littérale. Et ça, je me distingue de ce point de vue de Townsend, par exemple. Euh, Peter Townsend, dans son bouquin sur Smart City. Moi, je pense qu'il faut vraiment penser quand même à des formes un peu d'intelligence pas habituelles pour l'instant. Et petit deux, je pense que le design est extrêmement important. Alors que dans, dans la plupart des bouquins sur les Smart City, c'est absolument pas présent. Et petit trois, je pense qu'IBM, Cisco, etc., c'est... Très bien pour piloter les systèmes de métro, mais ce n'est pas le futur de la Smart City. Voilà. All this inf uh, okay. la, la question française, c'est tous les nouveaux systèmes oui. qui lisent nos events, nos events un oui. petit peu partout dans l'espace et tout oui. ça, ça se fait sur l'humain. Est-ce qu'on a commencé à appréhender l'effet de tout ça sur le corps humain? Et quelles vont être les conséquences, ou est-ce que c'est comme la balance, est-ce que ce n'est pas très important? Non, mais c'est là où la perspective du cyborg, il faut... Bon, J'ai commencé à m'intéresser au cyborg, parce que le cyborg, ça commence avec la vaccination. Si, si, vous voulez, si les enfants ne meurent plus entre 0 et 5 ans avec des, des taux euh, genre plus de la moitié, etc., c'est qu'on est déjà devenu des cyborgs depuis longtemps. Bien sûr qu'il y a un effet sur le corps humain. Et bon, actuellement, en France, on est en train de discuter à nouveau sur le bisphénol, par exemple, et, et tous ces problèmes. Bien sûr qu'il y a des effets sur le corps humain, et bien sûr qu'ils ne sont pas tous heureux. Euh, on me demandait tout à l'heure ce que je pense. Je pense qu'il n'y a pas de progrès qui, qui ne soit que du progrès. Il y a en général l'évolution technologique est rarement toute bonne. Et je pense que sur le corps humain, bien sûr qu'il y a des problèmes. 
Bon, et, et, mais, et on n'est pas, pas au bout de nos peines. Cela dit, je ne pense pas que ce soit la Smart City, avec le taux de, les taux de pollution actuels au mercure, etc. Euh, je ne pense pas que la Smart City soit le plus gros problème actuellement. J'aurais même tendance à penser que euh, si, on, si on, ça nous permettait déjà de gérer mieux, par exemple, les, 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 les questions de recyclage, etc., on ferait des progrès. Mais bien sûr que ça a un impact sur l'homme. Euh, et, qui, et qui est non négligeable. Euh, et de toute façon, on est déjà très bas. Vous savez, il y a les, les, les gens qui font des cartes mentales, là. Euh, déjà, le pouce chez les générations Nintendo, vous savez, on a une carte mentale du corps, dans laquelle le pouce, de, depuis le néolithique, a toujours été beaucoup plus gros que le petit orteil, dans, dans la place qu'il prend dans notre cerveau pour manager le pouce. Bon, mais aujourd'hui, le pouce est en pleine explosion. Bon, il euh, n'y a qu'à regarder le texting, euh, etc., le, le nombre de fonctions, le, même la géographie du corps a changé. Être un amputé du pouce, c'est beaucoup plus grave aujourd'hui qu'à que, qu qu l'époque de la plume d'oie. Uh, in a recent newspaper article, they were discussing putting Wi-Fi hotspots in Canadian national parks. And I was wondering, I know we said predictions are a dangerous path to walk, but if you have any take on having zones that are outside of the kind of cybernetic environment, and if you think that there'll be a push from people to have zones, like all the service, I guess. Well, I'm going to make a prediction, okay. Uh, <laughs> using my own experience, I was a long time ago a heavy smoker. And I remember very well when I was a heavy smoker, trying to quit, you tell yourself, I'm not going to smoke before eight o'clock or before eight, 10 o'clock or whatever, before noon, and you never succeed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now with email, I have exactly the same problem. You know, I'm telling myself constantly, I get up, no, I'm not going to go on my iPhone to see what happened. And in, in addition, since I live a little bit of a bicontinental life, usually at 8 o'clock, you know, people have been sending me message from Europe since uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, so uh, Eastern time. So, uh, so I try to resist and say, for example, I'm not going to open my email until 10 o'clock or I'm not going to read the news during a really boring intervention by one of my colleagues during the faculty meeting, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we all, so what do I want to convey? I think we are in a stage of addiction. We are in a stage of addiction because we have all these wonderful new gizmo and it has completely perturbated our life. And when I speak of a city of events, we are constantly ourselves in need of events. You know, the little email in which we read, dream that the queen is going to appoint us whatever. You, you know, this kind of improbable hope, that email, and also fear sometimes of opening your email and something really bad is going to pop up, uh, etc. We, we live in that and we're completely intoxicated. So yes, I think... And I think the problem of National Park, I would be pessimistic at first, I think, you know, just think that companies, airplanes used to be the place where you couldn't read your email. And more and more companies are off offering complementary connection. So that means that we're really addicted. So I think, yes, we'll have the, 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 we'll have the trees, the, the park, etc., plus Wi-Fi for the first time. And then we may, once we become a bit more mature, and all a bit less addicts begin, just like with tobacco, to wonder whether free smoke spaces, uh, you, you know, different world. But right now we're in the level, we're at level of intoxication, which are beyond reason. You know, it always strikes me that you cannot have a meeting with 10 people in which you don't have half of the meeting texting, even among people my age. You can, so you see with my daughter, you know, I take my daughter to dinner and she begins to text. <laughs> So for, uh, with my daughter, I was successful. Uh, you know, now no restaurant if there is texting, but. <laughs> J'ai une question pour vous. J'aurais aimé vous entendre au sujet de Montréal, savoir quelle était votre perception de notre ville. Est-ce qu'elle est intelligente? Quel est le travail qu'on a à faire? On ne sait pas que c'est une question dangereuse pour un Français, ça. <laughs> 
Moi, je pense que Montréal est une ville intelligente. Bah, c'est quand même connu comme étant une, une ville dans laquelle l'économie numérique, etc., s'est beaucoup développée. Je pense qu'il y, y, y a un côté intéressant à Montréal de ce point de vue-là, qui est aussi, je pense que côté juste... Bah, je trouve que Montréal, pour moi, serait une assez bonne illustration à la fois des forces et des faiblesses de, de, de la nouvelle économie des créatifs. C'est-à-dire, vous avez à la fois quand même des problèmes sociaux qui restent gratinés, dans, avec des, des problèmes de pauvreté dans certains quartiers qui restent gratinés, et puis cette espèce de nouvelle économie créative qui se porte très bien, et vous avez les deux. Euh, je dirais, bon, je pense que toutes les grandes villes aujourd'hui sont intelligentes, quasiment. Enfin, quand, dès qu'elles en ont les moyens, un peu, mais parce qu'il y a des technologies, par contre, qui coûtent cher, mais toutes les grandes villes sont intelligentes. Donc, euh, à vrai dire, je suis navré de devoir le dire, à Montréal, d'habitude, c'est plutôt la température. Il y a des tas d'autres choses qui me frappent. Par exemple, les, les couleurs des bâtiments canadiens me frappent toujours. Vous avez un goût pour le marron, par exemple, qui est, qui est quand même un truc que, que je connais nulle part ailleurs. Non, si vous voulez vraiment. Mais, mais côté numérique, ça me semble... Euh, oui, enfin, c'est plutôt même un peu en avance sur beaucoup de villes françaises. Mais enfin, c'est normal, c'est une grande ville. We are open, I mean, uh, Antoine is very generous, and he, I know that he likes to talk and take questions ah. and answer. I mean, we probably, I mean, have time for one more, otherwise, I mean, if there is one, otherwise, we'll thank him, I mean, but let's see. A very, oh, sorry. I'm, so, I'm not that quick. <laughs> So beware, you're the last question. <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering of the dangers of relying on numerical planning of a city because we're using programs which work better with certain forms, certain lines, certain functions. And um, we see it when we develop a building it does limit you because it forces you to take directions that work better with this program. And so we would be planning through a process that is not entirely ours. We rely on the way the program was built. And That's a good question. I, I think two things. The first is that it's true that, but you know, every tool is a constraint. So to, you have also to relativize that in so far that, you know, you take even the rules of architecture, the fact that there, you are constrained. Architectural education actually uh, is also a constraint. So you might take it positively and say, you know, this is a constraint. Under what condition the constraint may bring freedom? One of the conditions might be to develop a more critical... Why do you think I'm spending all this time studying on these things? Because I do think there is the need of a critique at a kind of theoretical, a, a bit historical, philosophical level. There is also a need of a kind of critique, very down to earth, of how to function, what they enable. I'm always struck, for example, you know, when you listen to Schumacher, you have the impression that parametricism is here. When you try to, to see what it does, it's rather here. So there is this gap, and it's... It makes you reflect a little bit. Now, yes, the, 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 you know, the digital has a lot of risk. That's true. I didn't mention terrorism, for example. You know, it's true that there are you know, uh, lots of risk. But you know, to conclude, perhaps since Maristella is uh, waiting, so I would say you know, the city is always a place in which you bring a lot of new stuff, which is usually dangerous stuff. Think of electricity. When we brought electricity to cities, you know, we brought with it a lot of danger, you know, blackouts, uh, all kinds of completely disruptive things. Uh, fortunately, cities have proved remarkably resilient. So what I'm hoping by the end is that they will once again prove resilient. <laughs>